My process for each project that I work on differs a lot just because each project has a lot of different needs depending on how intensive the outfit is to how intensive of a change I have to make with the actual doll itself. And usually I like to start with the outfit. I do that because I want to see the biggest change going from start to finish. The outfit I chose to do for Donna is the wedding dress in the first episode that she appears, which is the Runaway Bride. I had to really study the episode that this dress is in because it takes a lot of work to look at the ins and outs of a particular costume. You only have one episode and you're not going to get all the angles of that costume. That's not what the episode is for. This outfit actually has three layers for the skirt, and that includes a tulle skirt underneath, the satin skirt that's kind of like the main skirt, and then on top of that everything is chiffon. And if you don't know anything about chiffon, if you don't know anything about sewing, do not work with chiffon. This dress is gorgeous and I love it so much, but it's also probably the last time I will willingly put myself through using chiffon because it's very, very difficult to do. It's slick, it's thin, it frays a lot. I've used it a couple times before, like remnants I had when I was younger, and those projects did not turn out very good because it's a really difficult fabric to work with. Here's the top layer, or not the top layer, this is the top side of the very bottom layer. So you can see we have all the seams, our middle princess seam right here. And then this one I just did today, this is actually the lining fabric. This is the underneath side of this layer. Um, and it's got the same seams to match everything. And then this one is actually finished. I have it um, nice and hemmed. And this is the layer that's going to be on top of this one. So we have a nice um, satin and chiffon look going on. And that's the way it's going to look when it's finished. I also, with this project and a couple other projects I have coming up, leaned more into hand sewing, getting her straps to be tiny and lined to make sure that the chiffon didn't fray. I had to do a lot of hand sewing. One of the other big things about making this dress that was really tough is trying to find out how to do a closure. I'm not entirely sure, but I would venture to guess that the actual dress probably had a side zipper. But again, when you're working with miniatures, you can't always go based off of how the costume actually would be. So I decided to go with some crystal buttons in the back. And to my surprise, they fade in pretty seamlessly, which I'm very, very pleased about. I also was very shocked because upon my first few viewings of the episode, I had thought that the bedazzlement on the dress was actually pearly seed beads. And when I looked, it was actually more likely crystals or sequins, but just for simplicity's sake, I did decide to go with crystals. And I say simplicity's sake, but that's really honestly probably not the truth because it took a lot of crystals and a lot of time and a lot of money to get this outfit to the point where it is now. I honestly couldn't tell you how many crystals are on this dress because it's like hundreds. It's so sparkly now and I just love how it turned out so much. The accessories, that's a little bit of a different story. They were very difficult for me for a couple of different reasons. One being, curvy dolls have bigger feet than the classic or petite body styled dolls. The tall and curvy dolls both share a little bit bigger size shoe. And out of my like little shoe collection, I don't have that many curvy doll shoes and I couldn't find any like she wears. So I decided to go with some flats that have a little plastic bow look to them and painting them white took a really long time. The shoes in this outfit are 
the least important part of the outfit. So I didn't stress too much about that. The watch on the other hand was a little tricky because finding pieces to make a small watch was really tough. And ultimately that turned out to be my least favorite piece of the accessories as a whole. But it's not too terribly bad because it's not a giant focus of the episode, like I said, anyways. The next thing I'm going to have to do is the actual headband because they're two separate pieces. The headband is made out of like stuff that looks sort of like this. I made this out of just wire and white seed beads. And so I'm gonna turn this beautiful piece of wire into a headband, which I'll be doing in a little bit. But the funniest part about Donna's veil is how much work it was for me to find what I actually have it attached to her head using. Um, let me get it off. It looks like this. It's basically like a miniature hair comb. And as you can see, I just stitched it through these little holes. Looks very nice. Works very nice. It's, it's very nice. But I kept looking for, honestly, probably months, which is kind of sad, but I was looking for a small hair comb like that, and I just couldn't find one until I went to Claire's and found these beautiful fake hair extensions, and they have the perfect size hair comb for, like, a veil or, like, I guess if you wanted, like, a special hat. But the really nice thing about these, if I can get this one off, is... They are just stitched on, basically how I stitched mine on, so all you have to do is seam rip those off. As you can see, I did that with the green one for the one that she's got in her hair. I just seam ripped the three areas where it was sewn, but I think it looks really, really nice. Um, it's a little bit shorter than Donna's. I think hers comes down to about maybe mid-back. Uh, but I think overall the way the look is with the ruching and everything, it looks super nice. And I'm very pleased with how that turned out. And then here we have the actual doll that we are going to be working with. The trick with Donna for me is going to be doing the bangs because she has bangs. In my first attempt at a Donna doll, I did try to do bangs, but very poorly and with just hairspray. So this time I used a method of dunking her hair in boiling water, which worked a lot better. It was a really long process, kind of like with the shoes. It was a tedious process, but not necessarily difficult. Every time that you rubber banded her hair into place, dipped it in the boiling water, you had to wait for it to completely dry. Usually, I don't redo the hair until I have already completed the face, but with this it was a different story since I had to keep putting her hair in water, I didn't want to risk ruining her face. I choose the doll that I use based on some obvious factors, you know, when you're doing dolls based on characters, you pretty much already know what you're looking for. That can be a little tough though if what you're looking for is not available. That's when you're gonna have to do the rerouting or particularly doing the head swaps, you know, that's very common. I've already done that a few times for some dolls. And the thing that you have to be aware of when you're choosing a doll is that just because the body style is right and just because the hair colors right does not mean that it's the correct doll. The face shape is actually the most important thing, I think, when choosing a doll because that's what's really gonna sell whether or not the doll looks like the person. Whatever you're trying to do, it's really important to make sure that, especially if you're doing like your own character, from paper to actual doll, you have to make sure that the facial sculpt translates and that's a big part of it. I talked about that a little bit in my Rose Tyler video, how I realized that the past attempts that I made at creating a Rose Tyler doll were so far off because that facial sculpt was not correct, which basically meant it was impossible or almost physically impossible for me to make that doll look like Rose in the way that I wanted her to. 
So that's pretty much the biggest part about choosing the doll. Repainting the face, I am extremely pleased with. This is probably my most realistic doll I've ever made yet. It's a wonder what you can do with colored pencils that you cannot do with paint. Even just as a comparison between my Rose Tyler doll and this one right here, you can see how the realism is lent to the imperfections of the colored pencils. The colored pencils, you can't get a very pronounced winged eyeliner or you know, any of that. But when you look at people, if you think about it most often times, you can't see that anyways. That's what makes it so perfect. It takes a lot of time just because you have to consider all of the minute details. Corners of the eyes, you know, there's a lot of nuance to eyeballs. Eyes are really hard to do and you can't fret about them. I mean, I still do, but you can't try and get them precise and perfect like you can on larger scale drawings. And oftentimes it's better because if you try to put in too much detail, which is a little bit of what I did with my Rose doll, then you end up having that feeling of almost overcompensation where it looks fake because of it. If you compare the two, that's what it is. You can tell that there is some detail there, but it's not so pronounced that it looks manufactured and it looks fake. And ultimately that's kind of how I worked with my color pencils to get Donna to look and this facial sculpt gave me a little bit of trouble. It's a little rounder than I would have liked, but it's also very, very close. This project has really boosted my confidence and just boosted my excitement for the projects I have planned for the future. I've got quite a few in the works, but I just am really excited about the progress that I have made since 2018 when I started working on these types of projects. Rewind for a second. Remember about four minutes ago when I said this? The thing that you have to be aware of when you're choosing a doll is that just because the body style is right and just because the hair color is right does not mean that it's the correct doll. The face shape is actually the most important thing, I think, when choosing a doll because that's what's really going to sell whether or not the doll looks like the person. You might be wondering, why didn't you take your own advice? Because this facial sculpt obviously doesn't fit Donna's facial sculpt very well. Honestly, I'm not really sure why I didn't. In some ways, my brain just thought this other doll that I used for Martha is so close because it actually was like spot on that I thought this one was close enough, which is exactly what I warned everyone not to do. But to remedy it, I redid the actual doll. And this process took a really long time because I ended up having to do everything the long way, meaning an entire head swap, reroute, the whole nine yards. But the result ended up being something I'm way more proud of than the Donna I just showed that I had completed. Ultimately, I had already been aware that there was a doll that had a facial sculpt very similar to Donna's. Unfortunately, she had very dark hair. So I ended up buying that doll and turning her into the Donna that you'll see in a few minutes. This meant that I had to remove the doll's heads. Luckily, I've gotten very practiced at this the past few times recently that I've had to do this. So the process went a little bit smoother than I originally thought it would. The part I wasn't excited about was removing the hair. I've only done one reroute before this and I forgot how tedious and hard it is to get all of the hair plugs out from inside the actual head. So that took me quite a few days to just sit down and will myself into the headspace to put those tweezers into her head and rip those out. And 
once that was done, I was a lot happier because the reroute process, while again, also tedious and long, is a lot more exciting because you're seeing the progress towards what you want it to be, not removing what you didn't like about the original doll. I ended up getting some low temperature nylon hair that I used to create her hairstyle. This was a little worrisome for me that this was low temperature nylon because again, I've only done about one reroute, so I wasn't really familiar with which hair was best, but I actually really enjoyed working with this hair. It has a melting point of 190 degrees, which is a little bit below boiling. You do style it with warm water, but you gotta be careful to make sure it's not actually boiling, which is why you see me temping the water before I dip her hair in. With the styling process, it worked very well because it's low temperature and because just the slightest bit of warmth was actually helping to shape it. I ended up getting her bangs to look very bouncy and full, which is what I wanted originally anyways. But this is the first time I've been able to achieve it and part of that does obviously have to do with the type of hair that I used. For the actual repaint process, it wasn't me trying to conform a face to a facial sculpt that didn't match. Because the source material and the canvas I was using matched, it just flowed perfectly into place. That's what made this become my most realistic doll to date. Overall, I think this was just a really great learning experience for anyone. I obviously broke my own rule and I had to course correct in order to get my project to look the way I actually wanted it to. But the final design ended up being way better and shows just how impactful that facial sculpt can be. Oh.